um, I'm going to give an overview of um, one um, set of uh, studies that, uh, that we have been doing in collaboration with um, uh, St. John's Research Institute in Bangalore, or Bengaluru as, it, as it's called now. So first of all, I wanted to introduce you to my research team over in India. Um, some of these um, wonderful young men and women have been working with me for, gosh, for nine years now. And, and some are some are newer. And uh, this is um, uh, this was uh, the last time I was there, and we went out to lunch to celebrate that we had gotten two new grants, not just awarded by the NIH, but also through the not insignificant Indian bureaucracy, um, which in total took about three years from writing the grant to the launch. So um, uh, I I think. Um, it's absolutely doable, and anybody who wants to do work in India, I would love to chat with you about it. It, it just takes persistence, nothing else. So today, I wanted to talk a bit about stigma, because it's been a common thread through a lot of the work that we've tried to do, not just in India, but also in the US and, and uh, globally as well. Um, and stigma was not, it's something we hear about a lot in HIV, but it actually predates um, HIV in terms of having a role in healthcare. And um, I think um, pretty much all of you have um, heard of a uh, term of a disease uh, that's come to be almost synonymous pre-HIV with stigma. Um, and that being uh, a person who has leprosy or a leper. So talking about a leper is another way where people used to, um, uh, used to talk about somebody being stigmatized. And much of that early work was done by Goffman in the 60s. Um, and um, he said that um, for something to be considered stigma, it has to have two, co uh, two components. It has to be an enduring condition uh, or attribute, so it can't be having the flu or the cold or the measles or something. It has to be an enduring condition, and it has to be a condition that is negatively valued by society, not just your personal opinion, but society has to consider this to be a negative. And as a consequence of having this negatively valued condition, people are discredited and disadvantaged. So that's common to all stigmatized conditions. Um, these are terms that we hear used a lot. And I just wanted to run through them really quickly to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, prejudice is something that we probably all have of one kind or another. And, um, and that's an attitude as opposed to discrimination, which is a behavior. So I will be using those terms to talk about prejudicial attitudes and discrimina discriminatory behaviors. In terms of stigma, there are three um, aspects of stigma that you will read a lot about in the stigma literature. And that's enacted stigma, which is um, overt acts of stigma and discrimination. Um, so the events that somebody will, will tell you that they have experienced. Felt stigma, which it's an odd term because it sounds like it's, it's just your perception of being stigmatized. But the way that the stigma literature uses that term, it's very specific. It's the perception of societal norms. So when you hear somebody talking about felt stigma, it's the stigma that you perceive to be out there in society, as opposed to internalized stigma, which is when you have internalized uh, these attitudes yourself. Not unlike you may have heard about internalized homophobia, same thing, when you are actually starting to believe that. So for people who have HIV and who have internalized stigma, they themselves believe that they are gross and disgusting and, and worthless and you know, have gotten just what they deserve. Uh, the fourth term is something that I don't think we invented it exactly, but um, there were a lot of us at about the same time who started noticing that these three terms didn't quite explain all of the behaviors and attitudes we saw out there. Because even if you haven't experienced stigma yourself, 
as long as you have heard stories about it happening to other people or read about it in the paper or seen somebody being discriminated against, that can affect your behavior. So some people call that witnessed stigma, some call it heard stigma, and we've kind of settled on the term vicarious stigma. Um, so it's something that happens to others but still affects you very much. So why is this important? Why is HIV stigma important? Well, for one thing, it causes a lot of human suffering, um, which is obviously a bad thing. Uh, but more concretely, um, people report losing their jobs, uh, being evicted from their homes, being rejected by their family, ostracized by their communities, villages. Uh, kids are uh, prevented from go to going to school. Um, uh, people have a harder time getting married. And in countries like India and, and other places around the world where marriages are all often uh, arranged, it can also make it harder to arrange marriages for other siblings because you're seen as coming from an AIDS family. Um, in some more extreme conditions, people have gotten uh, quarantined, they have been abused, they have been threatened. And for us as HIV prevention providers and researchers, we find that stigma is a huge barrier um, to doing our work. So specifically, the health consequences that, that we have found in our research, which was what made me interested in, in pursuing um, stigma as a research topic in itself, is we had a hard time getting people to come to prevention programs. Because if it became known that this was an HIV prevention, people didn't want to come because they didn't want to be identified with this, this horrible disease, or they didn't want to be associated with the groups that are at risk. So men who would come, they'd say, you know, people are going to think that I'm gay. Um, or women who came said, WAP, for prevention programs, for treatment, even to sign up for your research programs. Again, people were afraid of being identified with the most at risk groups. Um, family members didn't want to provide care for um, HIV-infected family members. Um, and that's a particular problem in countries where um, there aren't hospice centers, per se, where families usually provide care for chronically ill members. Um, uh, a lot of families said, well, they can stay in our house as long as they are well enough where nobody can guess that there is something wrong with them. But after that, they're on their own which meant, of course, that people were homeless and, um, and often died on the street. And not surprisingly, the mental health consequences for people living with HIV are very severe. High rates of depression, high rates of suicide. So um, we decided that we wanted to study um, stigma straight straight on. Um, my, uh, my friend and colleague, Greg Herrick, who has done a lot of work on stigma and homosexuality, said that um, most of the time researchers mention stigma in their discussion sections. They'll do their research project on whatever topic they're interested in, and then they'll say stigma was a barrier either to enrolling people or getting people to stay with the program. But it's very rare, or it used to be very rare when we started anyway, to have stigma appear in the method section, to have that actually be the topic of your grant. Um, so we've worked in four different areas, and I just wanted to um, go through um, some examples of each today, because uh, this represents work that's been going on for about a decade. The first work we did was in, uh, in terms of establishing uh, measures and a theoretical model. Then we studied stigma among the victims or the targets of stigma, people living with HIV. Uh, we also went ahead and studied uh, stigma among perpetrators of stigma in the general population. And finally, among healthcare providers who can actually fall into either category uh, they can stigmatize and, and discriminate against the patients, but also when it becomes known that they are HIV service providers, 
other people have um, have given them a hard time about that. And um, I even had a postdoc who was working in the lab who said that her mom told her she needed to stop working with HIV-infected blood because the mom was having a hard time getting her sisters married when it became known. So uh, these, are some, these are some of our papers and, and the two grants that have paid for this. And I'm, I'm happy to um, share uh, references with you later for those who want to know more. So the first thing we did was we had all of these measures that had been developed in the US. But um, we didn't know if they would work in India. We didn't know if people were thinking about these issues the same way and uh, if our measures would make any sense. So we did a bunch of qualitative interviews, both with people living with HIV, with their family members, and with key informants. And we also reviewed uh, the Indian media to try to come up with articles related to HIV to try to get a sense of what questions to ask. Because as, as academics, we often sit in our, our ivory towers and we design these questionnaires and we have no idea really if that is what people are thinking. So um, these were some of the quotes uh, that, um, that we found both on the web and in the, um, in the Indian media um, that, um, that struck us. Um, so this is, this is what, uh, what happens to, um, to people and still does. So the first woman um, tells us that um, she was an AIDS widow and um, her whole village threw her out after her husband died of HIV. And she ended up, uh, she says here, that is an NGO that took her in because she had nowhere to go. Women who test positive, um, it will be assumed that um, they have had sex and they will, they will never get married. They will be an AIDS patient forever and they will be social outcasts. Um, landlords routinely evict patients um, or people uh, once it becomes obvious that they are HIV infected or if they find out, even if they know that it's not um, casually transmitted. The bus driver, um, who drove the children of that village to the school in a different town, tested positive. And uh, none of the villagers after that uh, got employment anywhere else. All the kids from that village were prevented from going to school anywhere else. And nobody wanted to have their children marry anybody from this AIDS village. Um, people routinely get uh, refused care in hospitals as well. And this was just the story of somebody who ended up dying in the ER once it became obvious that he was infected. So based on what we did, we came up with this theoretical framework. Um, I'm not gonna go over these again because we just talked about them. Um, the, the only term here that um, we haven't talked about yet is symbolic stigma. And basically that um, is based on having preconceived notions towards the people who are most at risk. So if you're already prejudiced against people, um, against female sex workers, against men who have sex with men, injection drug users, that is likely to influence uh, the level of HIV stigma that you have to. Um, not going to go through the percentages, but what struck us when we asked people what they had experienced, the percent are very low. When we ask them what they have heard about happening to other people, same categories, the percentages are way higher. So just about everybody has heard of somebody who's been ostracized or discriminated against, rejected by their families, uh, told that they can't uh, take care of a, a nephew or niece. Um, they've heard that even after you die, people won't touch your body. Discrimination goes on. Um, and, um, and not sharing food is a big deal because people usually bring their own food to, um, 
uh, to have lunch both at work and at school and everybody shares. Uh, so having to sit somewhere else and for people not to share food with you, it's a big deal socially. So it hasn't happened to many people, but just about everybody knows of somebody else that this has happened to. So what people do is, what any of us will do is they don't disclose. So instead they may say that they have TB or they just don't tell or they go to a hospital or pharmacy that is far away where nobody knows them. Um, or if they have rel their relatives are illiterate, they just won't read what it says on their, on their forms that they got from the hospital. So we call this stigma avoidance strategy. And here's our model. So as you will see, all of those are important. So enacted stigma up here has a direct relationship with psychological distress, um, and that was both anxiety and depression. Um, depression was measured with the uh, Beck Depression Inventory. Um, but this, as you remember, is not a lot of people. So if something has happened to you directly, it's definitely gonna have a psychological impact. What's more likely is that you will have heard of something bad happening to someone, someone else. That gives you the perception that it's a pretty stigmatizing world out there. If you think that, you are gonna avoid disclosing, you're not gonna tell people, and that too is gonna lead to depression and anxiety. Also, if you have internalized these values, that independently will lead you both to avoiding disclosure and to uh, depression. So that's what we found. So this is just a summary slide that of what I just talked about, so we don't need to cover that. So um, after we had determined that um, that uh, stigma did have an impact on, um, on mental health. We wanted to see what kind of impact it had on uh, behaviors too among people living with HIV. And um, this is the article that uh, describes those results. And basically what we found was that both having experienced stigma and having internalized these attitudes led not just to depression and avoidance of disclosure, but it also led to people not going to the hospital, not going to the clinic. And for those who did seek care, um, it also led to them not coming back as often, missing appointments, and not taking their pills, although that's not described in this particular paper. And I'm kind of rushing through this a little bit. Um, we did focus groups to find out specifically, because adherence is a big interest of mine, so specifically how does stigma affect um, adherence, and uh, the, the mechanisms underlying the non-adherence among the people who felt that um, uh, it was a nasty stigmatizing world out there, um, had to do with uh, privacy, and lack of confidentiality. And um, I don't know about you, but I guess you've realized by now that this is not a California accent here. I grew up in Sweden. And going from Sweden to India, it's, um, the two cultures really couldn't be any more different. This took a long time for me to figure out. Sweden is a country that's about the size of California, but only with about nine million people. Privacy is not an issue. I can get privacy anytime, anywhere in Sweden. Not so in India. Uh, most people are living in extended families, often multiple people sharing bedrooms, um, and uh, it's very hard to get any time to yourself. I never forget there was a woman who was in our focus group who took only half of her pills. And that's not a good thing in terms of developing resistance. Um, 
So we asked her, we said, but why, you know you're supposed to take your pill, it's just two times a day, why are you only taking it one time a day? And she said, you know, my mother-in-law is around me, my neighbors are in the same room, they don't know I have HIV, only my, I think it was her older brother and my husband are the only ones who know I'm HIV infected. If I keep taking this medicine twice a day, they are going to ask, they're nosy, they are going to ask me what this is. And she said, the only time every day that I have a moment to myself is when I bathe my children at night. And I smuggle one of my pills in there into the bathroom and I swallow it with the children's bath water. That's the one pill she could take every day. Because she knew that if it got out in the family that she had HIV, it was going to be bad news. She was going to be treated really badly. And she was the daughter-in-law. You know, so she wasn't living with her own biological parents. She was living with her mother-in-law. And uh, she just couldn't stand that. So this was the best she could do. So, but unfortunately, hi hiding pills and, and pill taking um, leads to missed doses and leads to the development of resistance and then the transmission of that and uh, second line therapy is not easily available and it's about seven times more expensive than first line therapy in India. Also related um, is the fact that um, there's not very much confidentiality at the local pharmacy. We had uh, one man who said, well, you know, my brother-in-law's best friend is a pharmacist. If I go to the local pharmacy and I ask for antiretroviral medication, the whole village will know that I'm HIV infected. So he had to take a rickshaw and go to another village or go to the big city where he could be anonymous. And sometimes during the monsoon or sometimes during uh, harvest season or sometimes during other times of year festival seasons, he just couldn't make it there. And they only get one month's worth of pills at the time. So sometimes he didn't uh, refill his prescription when he should. Maybe he got his new prescription a week late or two weeks late. Again, that leads to the development of resistance. And of course, people who had problems just remembering, as we all do, um, I think it's really important for all of us to remember the last time we were on antibiotics. Really simple regimens for seven days, 10 days at the most. How often have you, a few weeks later, found your pill bottle still with some pills in it? Because, oops, once your symptoms went away, you forgot. I know it's happened to me. And here we're talking about some really toxic medication that people have to take two, three times a day for the rest of their lives. So they re need reminders. But if people in your environment don't know that you have HIV, you can't put post-its up on your fridge. You can't put the pills next to your toothbrush or whatever kind of uh, trick that you use to try to remember pills. Um, because again, that would involve disclosure, which could cause harm. So um, these are the fears and the consequences among people who live with HIV. So are they warranted? So we went and uh, we decided to do a study among the general population who came in and sought care in healthcare settings. And this was a paper that we published in, in 2011, in AIDS and Behavior. Um, we did the study of a little over 1,000 people in two urban settings, in Bangalore and Mumbai. And we went to I think we went to over 40 different private and public hospitals and freestanding clinics and uh, interviewed adults who either were uh, sought care for a non-AIDS related condition or who were an, um, an accompanying person. Uh, we didn't uh, include healthcare workers or people living with HIV here because they were uh, parts of different uh, sub-studies that we had. Uh, we took people aside and interviewed them, and um, this may sound kind of odd, but this was practically very necessary. Uh, if we had uh, approached people who were about to be seen by the doctor, 
they, we would have had to take them away and they would have gotten last in line and um, they um, didn't want that. So we had to go to the point in the line where people had about an hour left before they could see the doctor, which is not hard, by the way, because these clinics, people come first thing in the morning and then they sit there all day. Um, so there were, there were still a lot of patients to, uh, to recruit. So um, we asked them, these were our um, outcome variables. We asked them about endorsement of coercive policies, and we asked them about intent to discriminate in their own lives. And as you can see, um, people overwhelmingly thought that um, there should be mandatory testing, and people with HIV should not be allowed to have children, uh, and they should not be allowed to get married. Um, people were also very high on blame. 82% um, said that those who got HIV through sex and drugs, they basically had it coming to them. Um, and more than 70% didn't think that people with um, HIV cared if they infected other people. So then we said, um, would, you, uh, would you be willing to seek treatment at the same clinic as somebody living with HIV? And of course, they didn't know that they already were. But <laughs> if we posed it as a question, the majority said no, they wouldn't. The majority also said that they did not want to eat from the same plate that somebody was infected with HIV and eaten from. Um, but to, uh, a third, little over a third of, uh, of the, uh, these people said they wouldn't seek um, health care from a provider with HIV. And this may seem like an odd variable, but um, there is a lot of eating by hand, and you feed children by hand uh, in India, and um, they, um, that was something else. They, they wouldn't feed somebody if they had, um, if they had HIV. Um, and um, about a quarter of them said that they wouldn't um, send their child to a class where there was an HIV-positive uh, classmate. And then we wanted to see, okay, so what are the drivers of the um, endorsement of the coercive policies and the intent to discriminate? And uh, not too surprisingly, education was negatively associated. Um, blame was positively associated, so those who thought that they had themselves to blame were much more likely to endorse restrictions on both marriage and, and also mandatory testing. Uh, if they, s high levels of symbolic stigma, so if they had negative feelings towards people living with HIV, all the groups that are at highest risk. Uh, that also predicted their willingness to endorse coercive policies. Um, and we measured uh, knowledge in two ways, both if people knew the correct ways that HIV actually is transmitted, and that was associated, lack of knowledge was associated with endorsement of coercive policies, and having misconceptions was highly associated with the endorsement of coercive policies, also with intent to discriminate. Um, which kind of makes sense. If you think that it's very easy to get HIV from a mosquito bite, from sharing a plate and so on, you are going to want to keep your distance. So I think we just said all of this. So finally, we were hoping um, after we had gotten all this information and we were kind of depressed ourselves uh, at the high levels of stigma out in the community and thinking, what are we going to do about this? Because it's not easy to go out in the community and do a community-based stigma intervention. We thought, well, the people with HIV that we interviewed, they said there are two places that this is particularly bothersome. One is the family and the other one is in healthcare settings. So we said, okay, let's go in and interview people who are actually working in healthcare settings. Surely they have been better trained and, and this, the, the story is better there than it was among, um, among the general population. 
After all, they're probably uneducated and, and they haven't really been learning much about HIV. So this is a paper, it's in press right now, it's about to come out this um, November in the Journal of the International AIDS Society. Um, and uh, so we interviewed about a third uh, physicians, nurses, and ward staff. Ward staff could be ward boys, ward aides, people typically with a 10th grade education, um, also in Bangalore and, uh, and Mumbai, in, a, in over 40 different healthcare settings, both government, private, for-profit, non-for-profit. Um, and they had to have worked in these clinics for at least six months, have direct patient contact, uh, be at least 18, speak one of the study languages, which is local languages or English, and, and able to give informed consent. Uh, we had to get permission from the uh, superintendents or director of medical uh, services. We got the department heads to help us identify um, and, and speak to the nurses and the ward staff, the doctors, because doctors are always special. Uh, they wanted us to contact them directly and set up appointments. Doctors are the hardest ones to get to interview. And um, a few of them, we only got through half the interview and then we had to set up an appointment to meet and finish. Uh, but um, we still managed to get over 300 of them, so we were quite pleased with that. And then uh, we did face-to-face -face interviews in their preferred language in a, in a private space at the work site. Um, and these are just the, the demographics. Um, not, not too surprisingly, huge difference in, in education for obvious reasons. Um, doctors and, and nurses, much more highly educated. Um, but I think it's interesting here that we have, we have a wide range among the ward staff. A third of them have uh, four years or less, um, almost a quarter of them between five and seven years, and then the largest group is here, eight to 10 years. Um, obviously, huge differences in income. Um, this is probably the most interesting piece for people who don't know uh, India. Um, nurses are, or Christian girls are much more likely to, or disproportionately more likely to choose nursing as a career. A lot of nurses um, come out of Kerala and go and work, which is a state that has a lot more Christians than, than other, many other states and go and work not only all over India, but also to the Gulf countries. They come here to the UK, they go to Australia and work. I think India's nursing schools are set up along a, a British model, so it's easier for them to get jobs here. But with the exception of the nurses, the vast majority of our participants were Hindu, which uh, makes sense in a country where about 80% of the population is Hindu. But, uh, this, this was the exception. And if it depressed me to have had so much stigma among the general population, this was even worse. Look at this. This is exactly what we saw in the general population. Almost everybody believed that mandatory testing ought to be the norm. Um, also, they wanted healthcare staff to be tested didn't think HIV infected women should be allowed to have children, didn't think that people living with HIV should be allowed to get married. Um, and it's, it's sad that this has to be the best news of the day, that only 50% of the doctors thought that people living with HIV got what they deserved. But compared to the nurses and the, and the ward staff, it was significantly less. I don't have all the p-values in here, but this was a significant difference. Um, so we asked them about intent to discriminate, like we did with, um, with the general population, except here we asked both about situations in their private lives, the same questions, and we also asked them if they would discriminate in professional situations. And the reason I call it high risk and low risk here, that is, uh, high risk for fluid exchange and low risk for fluid exchange because they have different jobs, so they don't do the same thing. 
So for nurses, a high risk may be to start an IV. A low risk would be giving somebody a pill. And even there, they said that either they would refuse to do it, 40% said they would either refuse to do it, or they would put the pill somewhere else. Some patients told us that the nurses would drop it in their hands or on their beds. They wouldn't touch them. Um, for the ward aides, the high risk situation was um, changing bloody linen, and uh, the low risk was um, washing the patient. And um, for the doctor, it was the, uh, the uh, low risk was just doing a regular physical exam, and the high risk uh, was um, dressing a wound, I believe. So that was really depressing. Similarly to with the general population, misconceptions, um, instrumental stigma um, just refers to fear and worry of casual transmission. Having negative feelings towards people living with HIV, blaming them, um, all associated with both um, with um, stigma in, in all healthcare workers. I just combined them all because they, they weren't that different uh, in this slide or we would be sitting here for hours. Um, let me see what else. This we thought was actually encouraging, that people who reported more frequent professional contact with people living with HIV were less likely to have stigmatizing attitudes. So that's something that one can build on. Um, so in, in conclusion, high levels of stigma attitudes in all three groups, the majority report that they would either refuse to treat someone living with HIV or take unnecessary precautions um, like not touching them or um, using double gloves or triple gloves and driving factors as we saw seem to include having negative attitudes toward people with HIV or the groups that are at risk, blame and fear and worry uh, about infection and uh, also misconceptions about casual transmission. So, I'm gonna wrap up after this, I think. Um, so what we did then, like good researchers, was we came up with, um, a, um, a design for our next study. So here are the key factors that we found to underlie stigma in the healthcare providers. I'm not going to go through them again because we just talked about them. And what we did was we've designed a study to work in 24 institutions, 12 intervention, 12 control, um, where we're going to target these factors. And we are, we're going to be um, using a, um, an intervention that was designed by the ICRW, the, Institute for, uh, the International Center for Research on Women. They came up with this lovely three-day intervention for healthcare providers around the world. Now, all of you work with healthcare providers. How many of you think that you can scale up an intervention that lasts for three whole days and get doctors and nurses and, and ward staff to come to them? We don't think so either. So we have distilled it down to three sessions instead, about an hour each. Two of them are going to be delivered on uh, computer tablets so people can do it at their own convenience. And one of the sessions is going to be in a group that is more skills-based and that's also co-facilitated by a person living with HIV because we found that uh, it, makes, uh, it makes a profound impact once you actually get to know somebody with HIV, you have a face to put to the disease, you hear their story, and they can tell you what it is that you are doing out in your practice that you may not think about as stigmatizing, but that is perceived that way by them. Um, so we actually did a pilot study among nursing students, and I'm not gonna take you through that because then we won't have any time to, um, uh, to uh, talk about this, but um, we found that we, um, 
When we did this with nursing students, we had 100 of them, 50 intervention, 50 control. We actually improved knowledge, we decreased blame, we um, decreased their endorsement of coercive policies, um, and um, Im improved knowledge, which is not so hard to do, and we decreased um, the intent to discriminate. So, That study is, I'm going to the launch meeting in, in Bangalore this November, and we're going to have um, 16 sites in South India, eight sites in, in Northern India, and I can't wait to see what happens when we're actually trying to implement this. So <laughs> I just know I, that there will be surprises, that's all I know. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but, but that's, that's why we're not working in laboratories, because we want to do things that are meaningful, but it also means that you don't have as much control. Um, so I spent probably a little over a month here working with, uh, with Richard Harding, as I think most of you know, um, this summer to try to figure out our overlapping areas of interest and how we can um, identify areas of collaboration where we can take my background in, in stigma in HIV in India and all of your backgrounds in uh, palliative care in, um, in Europe, in Africa, elsewhere around the world. And um, we were actually very fortunate that two calls came out from the NIH this summer uh, to do research to characterize and reduce stigma to improve health. And that's the National Cancer Institute that put that out. Uh, so we started um, uh, outlining a, a small grant to do some descriptive research on stigma that's associated with cancer and pain management in India, following a similar model for what we've been doing with HIV. Uh, and uh, that one I think we are thinking about submitting in February, right? And then as we were going on that, uh, on that grant application, um, there was a second uh, opp funding opportunity uh, that um, allows for uh, what they call foreign components, so global health research, called Building Evidence, e Effective Palliative End-of-Life Care Interventions which is exactly what, what all of you are doing and um, here at the Institute. So we're thinking about uh, taking the tools that have been developed here and, and used in Africa and um, I think also in Europe successfully and, um, and implementing them in India and um, adapting and implementing them and evaluating them. So that's, that's the second study and that one I think has a due date of June or July next year. So those were two ideas that came up right away. Um, I'm so happy that our institutions have uh, decided that, um, uh, signed an MOU, that, that they want us to collaborate across campuses. Um, I know that you sent a couple of people over to UCSF this year. I'm hoping that the funding stream will continue and, and more of you can come over to UCSF and work with us and teach us about what you're doing and, and how we can collaborate in the future. And I'm happy to take questions or discuss other ideas. Thank you.